Hello, everyone, and welcome to this FMB webinar. So uh, my name is Hayley Lorimer. I'm Director of Membership Services at the FMB. Really good to have you with us this afternoon. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is Sarah Fox, who um, her business title is the 500 Word Lawyer, which is a brilliant title for a business because it tells you exactly what you need to know about Sarah, which is that she likes to keep things uh, simple, which we all like. So that's great. Um, we have a dispute resolution service at the FMB that tries to mediate between our members and their customers when things have gone wrong with a building project. And we notice that that's often at the end of the project. That's when things tend to go a bit pear shaped sometimes um, when that find the crunch point of getting the final bill being presented to them, etc. So we thought, wouldn't it be great to ask Sarah to come along and talk about how to avoid those kinds of situations and how to close off projects in such a way as to make sure that you get paid on time and that everybody's happy at the end of the job. So that's what Sarah's going to talk about today. Um, so I will mute myself and hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Hayley. So uh, we're going to talk about how you can close off projects to make sure that your clients are happy. Now, I can't guarantee happiness. Um, I can't guarantee that you will end up with happy clients. But what we can do is give you the tools that you need in order to try and get the happiest possible clients. Uh, we know that any project can suffer from issues such as um, pandemics, restrictions, sanctions, trade, um, floods um, and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes uh, builders too can make mistakes. But in many cases, reasons why your clients are unhappy is because they uh, their expectations have not been met. Now, it could be that they are a particularly picky client who has very high expectations, or it could be that the um, story that they have in their head about what you are going to do and what you've done don't match. And that creates this kind of gap um, and dissatisfaction. So in this webinar and in an article coming shortly in the FMB magazine, we're going to consider your obligations and give you some tips on how to manage clients. So happy clients are best dealt with at the start of the project. We want to have happy clients. We want to be involved in projects that are successful. We don't want to be involved in the failures. Yes, they make great conversations down the pub, but ultimately they don't help us to get business. Um, sometimes the pushy clients are the ones that are really tricky. They, the ones that don't want to compromise and always believe they're in the right, even though they've never done this sort of project before. But sometimes by managing them better with the, at the start, you can actually um, head off these issues before they happen. So one thing that you can do is ask better questions. If you've been in the business for many decades, like I have, you kind of start to have assumptions. You kind of think you know what they're asking for. And it's really easy to kind of fall into a pattern that means you don't ask the questions you really should have done because you kind of just want to get on with the job. So one of the things we can ask them is what does success look like for them? So many really high end clients or Picky clients have really very specific stories in their head or visions of what they want to achieve. And we if we don't ask those questions then we might fail to meet their expectations. We want to know what keeps their clients awake at night. Why are they doing the project in the first place? We want to know what's most important to them. Is it having it done quickly because they've got a pressing need for an extra bedroom because somebody's coming back from university or somebody's leaving their own home or selling it is cost really important and yeah cost is always important but have they got a very limited budget no flexibility or are they the sort of client where perfection and high quality is the most critical they can't have all of those they often want it but we need to know which ones are most critical because that will help us to um, meet their needs better we also want to know how the works that they we've kind of scoped will meet their needs. You know, why are they asking for another extension? What do they, is it because they want bragging rights? Is it to keep up with everyone down the road who's got an extension? Is it because they need it for a specific purpose and doing more working from home or is somebody coming to live with them? Have they got more caring responsibilities? All the sorts of things. Now, 
whether that's a domestic client or commercial client, nobody does building just for the vanity of it, unless you're Donald Trump. So everyone has a particular need that they want to achieve. And what does that mean for the contract? What do you need to write into your contract to reflect back these issues that are important to your client? By doing that, does your contract enhance trust with your client? Does it reflect what they're seeing, the story they've got in their head, the vision they've got? Because it's very easy to write it in a way which you understand, but which doesn't really reflect the client's concerns. So getting your contract right can be a really good way to kind of manage your client's expectations early, to set out what you're going to promise and to make sure that you will meet those promises. So clients want to know why they should work with you, but also they want to know what it's like to work with you, how to work with you. What do they have to do? And one of the things we tried to do when we did the uh, review the FMB suite was to be really clear what the client's obligations were, particularly for clients who are new to construction. So most of our clients know that they have to pay you. And that's maybe the bit that they find the trickiest because, you know, most of them aren't rolling in money. But they also have to give you regular instructions, approve things. Now, sometimes that role they don't do particularly well. Um, often they struggle because the things that you're meant to do like finish the work on time or to agreed standards those are difficult to define with certainty and with objectivity so a lot of those are quite subjective decisions and clients obviously prefer their own um, version of events shall we say so it's really important when it comes to understanding our role what each side is going to do and how they balance with each other um, if you've got um, a new client, you may need to be wary because particularly if there's a project that's half completed and you've been brought onto the job, you might want to know why it went wrong in the first place. So asking better questions is also about finding out why, why, why isn't this progressed? Is it because it's been difficult to get planning or is it because they're a really tricky client to deal with? I know you didn't go into construction for the paperwork, but the contracts will help you to manage client expectations. So, you know, if you put things in writing and writing, I don't necessarily mean now pen and paper because emails, text, social media messages are all a form of written record. It's much easier now to create written records than it's ever been. But if you start to put things in uh, writing, it can really help at the end of the project because we remember what's been said to us much more than we remember what we say. So a client might ask you to do something and immediately forget it. And that's not necessarily because they're trying to get one over on you. It's just the way memory works so that by recording what they've said to you and sending it back to them, they get an opportunity to reflect whether or not that's what they really want, but also you've got a record as to what's been said and when it was said. So when we looked at contract contract contents, it's really important to look at the bare minimum that you need. So who's doing the works, what works are going to be provided with the right sort of um, uh, when you describe your scope of works in a way that clients can understand, not just you how much price and cost we know that there's big price issues at the moment inflationary issues so are you doing it for lump sum is it a fixed price how long is that going to be fixed for have you got a right and do you want a right to increase those costs where energy costs or supply materials increase when are you going to finish it by and is that a fixed guaranteed time scale because that's what your client thinks or will it flex given what happens on the project what are the quality standards your client is looking for? And they should be as precise as possible because anything that's based on the opinion of your client means that the pernickety, vexatious, you know, pushy clients will virtually never be satisfied. So if you can possibly come up with a quality standard that's a more objective or that involves a third person making a decision on behalf of both of you, that's a better way than leaving it in the hands of a client. Some clients are reasonable, some just really struggle with that reasonable thing. Working out why they want to do it, what's time, cost and quality, what's important and how are you going to do it? What does it look like? What does it feel like to do a construction project? 
most people's understanding of construction is either based on newspaper articles about things that have gone wrong or you know television programs that's not necessarily a good representation of how we do business so all the fmb contracts have an opportunity to talk about the clear scope define what is in your responsibility but also what's not so this comes from the short form contract this um, segment it says what your price doesn't include it also say tasks which are not your responsibility those are really good way to flag what you where the demarcation is and where the edge of your responsibilities ends and where their responsibilities might start your scope is really important to ensure that your client knows what is included in the price and what's excluded whether or not you've completed all the works that they think they've promised to determine whether or not it's an extra when they ask for something if it's excluded it's clearly an extra but you know there's scope for misinterpretation and to be really clear when you've finished everything that's needed so it's a major cause of friction when the clients think something was included in your scope and included in your price and it turns out that they had made an assumption which was wrong so this was a project where a, um, a dispute arised from works to a nursing home. The court found there were virtually no reliable documents to provide evidence of what had been agreed between the parties. So although it was meant to be completed by a certain date, um, that date had probably been waived. Nobody really knew there was no real evidence. So this is a really good reminder to put things in writing. This was hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of work, which there was basically nobody really knew what they were meant to be doing to what standard and when really dangerous position to be in you're going to end up in court. So next we need to think about price price is the biggest friction in globally in any sort of commercial transaction. So there's a number of things you can try and do to kind of resolve the price issues. Um, the experience from the FMB dispute service is showing that clients are increasingly uh, withholding more money. Now, you might find it easier to get a deposit before work start to deal with inflationary issues and to make sure that they're really committed to this project. You might need to think about whether or not we continue to work on fixed prices. Now, for decades, we've had fairly good price certainty, but now we're moving towards estimates that can be revised right until the point you start work or even a cost plus, and that means you get paid your cost plus a proportion for profit. You might want to shorten the periods between regular payments, but you need to make sure that your client knows about this and has agreed it with whoever's funding the project. Now, not many of them have a nice little golden pot sitting somewhere in their house that they can just dip into. If they've got to apply to a bank for funding, then you need to make sure that all of that is seamless. Um, there's increasingly um, that clients are looking for higher retention rates, so moving towards 10% instead of 5%, um, and sometimes refusing to pay that final retention or final stage payment, quibbling over issues, snagging, um, using it as an excuse not to pay. Um, that could be because they're also under financial pressures, because it could just be that they're playing hardball. And you may want a right to increase your prices when necessary. Now, we know that as far as possible, we want price certainty as much as the clients want price certainty. But sometimes that's just not possible. So sometimes we need a right to increase prices. Um, and then for some clients, it might be relevant asking them to buy the materials themselves, because some clients are kind of um, kind of trying to play the um, trying to play a game with you when it comes to pricing. Um, so really important if they continue to uh, put pressure on costs, then you could ask them to buy those materials themselves. So one of the things I developed um, when I was writing my book on uh, small works contracts, I did a load of uh, research with people who'd recently had construction projects done and payment came out as a big friction. So I created a happiness checklist um, so that you could ask clients you know, do they really know what's going on? Now, this was developed a couple of years ago before we had inflationary issues, but you can get a copy of this on my website so that you can ask the right questions uh, to make sure that your clients are gonna be happy with the end result and with payment. If you don't ask these questions, there's a risk that you've not successfully managed your client's expectations on costs right at the start. And that's a really useful um, tool. 
So when it comes to timescales or program, um, COVID at least has confirmed for most clients that programs are a bit of a moving feast. It's really important to confirm whether the timescale is guaranteed. And as this, as the short form um, FMP contract says, it's not guaranteed because circumstances change. Um, current completion date is flexible. So really important that clients begin to understand that. And you can, we can help clients to understand and to manage their expectations by being really clear in our contracts with them. So from the um, bigger contracts, we've got a timeline that looks at how that timeline might change. Um, generally speaking, if you've only got a date for completion, it's for you as a builder or contractor to plan the work as you see fit. There is no interim dates, whatever the client is expecting in terms of progress, actually it doesn't matter um i'm not suggesting you take the sort of um two different approaches you might have for say revising for exams there are some people who will do it regularly all the way up to the exams make sure they're on top of it there are some people who come skidding in at the last minute work overnight hang into the exam and do it all at the last minute now under construction contracts and english law you're entitled to take the skidding in at the last minute i'm not suggesting it's a great way to do it um, and it will make your clients a bit twitchy. And one of the questions I know that we've had um, from clients is, why isn't the builder turning up every single day at 8.30 and staying all day until 4? Well, it could be that they're trying to get materials, they're trying to get supplies, they're trying to get approvals. Um, clients have certain expectations about when you're going to turn up and how many people are going to be there and how long you're going to stay. Some of that is just about being open and honest with them and communicating with them as the project progresses so that they kind of understand why you don't turn up the next day. Because they will start to get suspicious quite quickly. Once you've started to lose their trust, it can snowball quite rapidly. So keep communicating about what's happening, whether you're in delay, whether there are things causing problems, whether you still need to get materials because your windows supplier has let you down or whatever. So there are various events which will extend the completion date. Again, sharing information regularly with your client is the best way to make sure that they understand. Um, it's really rare on uh, certainly domestic projects to include interim dates for completion, um, more so on commercial. But clients don't often understand what completion is. Now, under English law, completion is not perfection. It's not absolutely every T crossed and I dotted. So it's completion of most of the scope of the works with minor items outstanding that do not affect the client's use of the project as intended. So, for example, a house should be watertight, it should be operational, it should have heating, but if there are minor cracks in the plaster, a couple of door handles missing, that would be a minor defect, which still allows it to be completed. Now, if a spire is twisted and it was meant to be straight, that's not carrying out the scope of works as intended. However, we can still use that roof, it's still watertight, so it still can be used as intended. So. Um, Completion is quite a, a combination of objective and subjective measures. Has everything on the list been provided and can I use it the way I expected it to? Now, client expectations, again, come into what is completion, but this is a pinch point for most projects. This is a point at which the client's um, whole kind of emotional, intellectual and uh, legal um, interests all combine together at one point. So we need to understand the process of completion and why it's so important. And that's partly because all these things contractually happen. Your principal obligations are now finished. You're basically free to go and do something else. Um, at completion, we end up starting a defects period by which you only have to return to site to rectify any defects. A limitation period starts, that's the limitation period under English law, which entitles them to bring a claim if you have breached your contract. Link to completion is payment of final bills and often half any retention if there is a retention of process. We also share or we also pass risk and insurance obligations in relation to the works to the client and title in any materials that are on site pass if they haven't already passed. Of course, if there are delay damages for late completion, that kind of crystallizes at this point. 
and you're licensed to enter the site and go back to the client's house or client's premises is limited. You're only allowed to go back to uh, rectify defects. So this is the point at which you won't be turning up at 8.30 on the dot and asking for cups of tea regularly. So these things are quite significant contractual and legal obligations. And it's quite a big shift at this point between your construction period and the defects period in terms of the risk, responsibility and remedies of the parties. And this is a key pinch point because of this. This is, of course, the point at which the client wants to start using the completed works for whatever purpose, selling it on, renting it out, operating something under it. So this is a point at which the commercial, technical, operational and legal points really do kind of end up in a bit of a firework. So this is when they are most unhappy. Now, interestingly, um, before we introduced uh, adjudication, which is a form of dispute resolution, 80% um, of disputes waited until completion for a kind of a big bun fight. Instead of resolving them as the program project had gone on, we waited until completion and then just dumped everything on the contractor. Um, particularly in the commercial sector, that has changed very much so that now about 80% of disputes are resolved before completion. Um, but for a lot of um, ho domestic homeowners, this is still the point at which they're going to raise the issues they didn't have the courage to raise while you were regularly on their premises. So part of it is their fear of um, their fear that you would re react badly if they raised an issue whilst you were there regularly. Now you're no, not on site, but kind of relax a little. And sometimes that's why you get these sort of comments at completion, which actually, frankly, it would have been much easier to resolve if they told you earlier. So some of it is as about understanding human nature. But what we want to do is make sure the contract is really clear, talking about how you'll carry out work regularly. But here at the bottom of this slide, you can see that once the works are substantially complete, we're not promising perfection, you'll leave the property clean and tidy, dispose of waste, provide them with instructions, warranties and certificates, outline any maintenance or operating issues they need to be aware of, and agree a date to return to your property to make good minor defects. And it says earlier in the um, this section, they rectify defects for six months after completion. So this is what happens on completion under the short form contract. And similar sorts of things happen under the domestic contract. So um, com substantially complete the work so the site is ready to be handed back to you ready for use, even if there are some minor defects by the end of the works period. So really important that we make it clear that perfection is never promised in any of the FMB contracts. And it's never been a requirement, not for 150 years under English law. So it's really, really important that clients kind of get that quite early, that they're not expecting perfection, that there will always be a few things that they just need to be resolved later on. So, of course, at completion, we need to talk about money. So final bills have to be um, submitted, um, credit for work already paid, final valuation of the works, um, and then they will pay you. Now, you know, in practice, that sounds really easy, but this is the point at which they may tot up how much they've already paid you and realise they don't actually have the money left. Um, those are difficult conversations and not easy to resolve. Um, we also need to think about time. Should it have been extended? Are there on any obligations in relation to delay defects? Um, uh, sorry, delay damages. Do you have to pay them because you've been late? Um, really important that we understand the impact on the project. Now, clients can, in fact, get in your way. So one of the things it's really important to talk about is whether or not um, the works period should be extended for their failure to give you access or for um, failing to give you instructions or delaying giving you instructions um, because clients don't really think about the impact they might have on the whole way you've planned the project. Um, so, you know, it could be because they're working from home and they're now there on site, able to quote unquote supervise you. Um, 
So it's really in clear. You should be clear at the beginning whether or not you want exclusive possession. They move out. If they're going to be on site, take into account, take it into account. The other thing always to remember as a builder is that health and safety is your concern and you need to make sure that they're not mucking you about and not um, doing things which are unsafe or put people at risk. So when it comes to quality, we're always looking at the defects process now under the Consumer Rights Act. So although this is a commercial um, contract, the Consumer Rights Act requires you to repeat performance or refund um, money if you have breached uh, the use of reasonable skill and care in carrying out the works. Uh, but generally speaking, the defects period is how we avoid claims like that. It's really important and it deals with simple snagging. It's six months after completion where you will put right defects in the work due to your faulty workmanship or materials. OK, so unfortunately, however, this sort of defects in the works, some unreasonable clients are using them to avoid payment. Um, they might even exaggerate what we consider to be a minor issue to make it a major issue as now a structural defect or something that's covered by insurance in order to kind of up the ante. Um, this is the difficulty sometimes when we have clients and without a contract administrator, they just don't have the um, emotional distance to be able to make those decisions properly. They've invested a lot of time, money, energy and effort into the project maybe not as much as you but they've invested heavily in this project and sometimes it's a psychological issues which are more important than actually the factual ones so should the millennium bridge have wobbled on completion well of course it shouldn't that's why they spent 18 months trying to fix it um because there's nothing worse than seeing a lot of school children on a sponsored walk going a little green around the gills when they get a bit seasick should the Leaning Tower of Pisa have lent? Well, obviously, uh, now it's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but when it was originally planned, it wasn't planned to have this um, jaunty lean. Um, so defects can um, be kind of funny, like the Millennium Bridge, or bring in masses of money in tourism, like the Tower of Pisa, or they can be catastrophic. And this was a home um, not carried out by a Federation of Master Builder um, um, uh, contractor but this 10 million pound home ended up with hundreds of snagging items the client and their wife uh, who were very rich were very unhappy that what they envisaged to be their dream home didn't have the quality they wanted or expected however what had happened when they first set up the contract was these clients who were extremely picky so they were right at the end of the maximizer scale um, hadn't been able to describe what functionally they wanted this property to do. They had lots of kind of dreams and visions and mood boards, but they couldn't actually describe it in a way which somebody else could look at and go, oh, right, OK, I know what you want. Um, uh, they relied on vague terms like luxury or best quality. And when it went to court, the judge was really sympathetic to the contractor who basically said, I'm not sure how you could ever have met their expectations because their expectations were never clear. They were never um, objective. They were very difficult to kind of get a grip on. So really important. It did end up in a multi-million pound dispute going to court. It also ended up in court fees that were so um, extensive for the building owner that they had to sell the property to pay for the court fees. So disastrous project for all involved, um, which could have been resolved at the beginning by better clarity and all the way through the project by better communication. This client buried their head in the sand and said they didn't want to know until it all became way too late. So completion, we've said that in terms of time, cost and quality, final bill should be submitted, including any extras. And in fact, those extras should not be a surprise to your client. That's the worst thing you can do is save it up and tot it up at the end and go, oh, hang on, we're going to have to charge them a bit more. Those extras should have been being agreed with the client as the project progressed. You need to make sure that you get in your final bill, final stage payments, um, and also discuss how 
long you've got to do the defects and to sort them out ideally get them all done within the six months and then you can get your final money and then anything to do with loss and expense or delay damages where relevant should be confirmed and sorted out so tidy off all the con the money issues but generally speaking it's the extras that cause the difficulty for clients because they were not expecting those again when it comes to time extensions or completion dates should be agreed um, and then the defects period starts and anything that they notify you about, you have to resolve if you believe it's your responsibility and rather than the client having used or damaged the property since you left site. Um, but this, instead of a luxury £10 million home, this was a very ordinary home, but got a massive amount of press interest and not so long ago because the owners of this started listing all the defects in their new home and there were or there were tens of these defects they moved out a total of three times to allow the um, builders to rectify defects um, the house was only bought for three hundred and fifty thousand pounds but was in the papers a lot in 2018 when they basically went to town on explaining what was wrong with this um, and this put the whole sector actually in quite a bad light as being you know uh, tarring the whole construction sector particularly home builders with the kind of cowboy builder sort of um uh, trope and it was really unfortunate that it had got to this point i can't help thinking that better communication would have helped but also um, the client understanding exactly what they can expect at completion and not moving in until they were happy um, rather than constantly moving out so one of the things that we've talked about um, is looking at getting a project handover certificate so that clients begin to understand exactly what has happened and how where you've got to on the project actually reflects the um, provisions in the contract. Now, the clause referencing, I think, is for the domestic or um, commercial contract rather than the short form um, because we don't have 17 clauses in the short form, but it basically refers back to the contract. So that's why we kind of come full circle what we've promised to do was in the contract this is that we've done it so this is what's left to do the bit that says we will put right these minor defects but trying to tie it all in so the client understands how that's all worked is really useful so this sort of certificate could be quite useful for just putting a nice neat tidy end to it because the end of a project can be a little bit messy a little bit tense a little bit unpleasant whereas actually if we could sit down and just go actually we've done everything that we said we were going to do site is ready to be handed back ready for use we've tidied away materials look how clean and tidy it is why don't we sit down have a cup of tea or something stronger if you wish and celebrate the completion of this project it's pretty unusual to have a celebratory end to the project but actually, that's the sort of thing that we need to look for if we want to end up with happy clients and successful projects. So when it comes to nipping issues in the bud, other than dealing with the contract properly, um, engaging with the client and constantly keeping in communication. There are so many tools by which you can communicate with your client. Um, if they're on site or off site, there are really good ways to communicate with them. They might want to shy away from some of it, but actually maybe a cup of tea at the beginning where you sit down and say, what are you going to do? What's outstanding? What's behind schedule? And that kind of stuff could help. Keep asking questions. The things that they thought they wanted might not be what they actually want once you start on project. Make sure you keep records, whether it's electronic records or written records, it doesn't really matter. Ideally, constantly keep sending them to the client so they have a copy of the records and then resolve issues directly face to face where possible. It is much easier for them to be keyboard warriors and send off a series of quite unpleasant emails to you than it is to sit down in their kitchen or in their home or on a neutral ground if that um, makes them happier to sit down on neutral ground and, and actually talk to you about it. Um, because then it becomes back to the personal back to the human as opposed to back to being company against company or client against contractor so engage directly where you can um, and if they're feeling uncomfortable ask them to bring a friend 
uh, reflect the fact that for some of them, they feel really nervous dealing with um, people who've been in the business a long time. They feel on the back foot and you want them to feel um, safe when they uh, can raise questions with you. So for you, if you end up with a client who does turn out to be Mr. Pernickety or Ms. Pernickety, seek help. There are plenty of ways you can seek help. Um, if you fail to negotiate with this client, you can try the facilitated mediation available through the FMB. You can ask for help from the legal uh, advice lines from the FMB and get, get help early to help you deal with things as they progress. Because once something has become an issue, you need to resolve it in order to get on with the project. Um, don't let them fester because it's like John Grisham, who used to write about law firms, um, said he used to call things fish files or fish projects. And a fish project is one that sits on the corner of your desk, just getting smellier and smellier and smellier. And this is what happens with construction projects. When they start to go wrong, they just get smellier and smellier and smellier. So nipping things in the bud quickly is the best way to make sure that you don't end up with an unhappy pro client and therefore a lack of success on your projects. So that's what I wanted to deal with just to kind of give you some tips from people who've been there, done it, and also to think about how you can use your contracts to deal with that in advance. Um, but are there any questions, Hayley, that we need to deal with that have arisen during that? Yes, I've got a question, actually, but I would say to the members attending, if, if there are any questions occurring to you, you can uh, type them in the Q&A box or the chat box at the bottom of the screen there, and we'll go through those in a moment. Um, couldn't agree more with you about the importance of getting everything in writing, because that's something that we do see in the dispute service where things have been agreed, not put in writing, and then it's a he said, she said situation, which is very difficult to resolve. But the question I wanted to ask was about the objective quality standards, because we see quite a lot that members uh, rely on building regulations sign off. They'll say, well, it's been signed off by building control, so it's fine. But sometimes, the because that's a statutory minimum standard, isn't it? And that sometimes the consumer's expectations are higher than that. But I can't think of a, an easy way of, objectively describing the standard that you're looking for as a consumer or a builder is there, is there any reference well, so, some of it so for example if they wanted um if they're asking for an air conditioning unit or something that's a piece of kit then you can describe the sort of the temperature range that you're going to get or the energy use or the number of lumens you get from light in a specific room so there are ways of dealing with kind of particular aspects of your project. But also, if you say it complies with building regulations, most consumers haven't got a clue what that means. Yeah. They don't know whether that means it's safe, it's not going to fall down. Um, and they don't, you know, they won't know about the um, gapping in balustrades on stairs to stop children falling through. They don't care. They want it to look nice. You know, they're often not as worried about safety as um you know uh, regulators would have us believe yeah they want to live in a home that feels safe but they don't know what the building regulations say so building regulations or statutory requirements or even planning doesn't necessarily create any sort of visual story in their head or any expectations they're kind of going well that's a bare minimum i expect you to be legal <laughs> you know so it is kind of about trying to speak to them and say you know what are you trying to get from this and we had an occasion where somebody was building a porch for us and i basically said i want it as you know i want it to look nice like the rest of the home because what I, it hadn't been the rest of the home but i actually want it big enough to store shoes in and then it didn't you know it, we ended up with this sort of I, I don't really care about the finishes but i want it to match the rest of the home i don't know how to describe a finish on a wall internal or external because i you know i'm a i'm a normal person i'm not involved in the <laughs> sector i'm not saying you're not normal people but you know it's difficult for us to describe but actually i was saying you know kind of instead of giving me drawings which i was struggling to visualize you know tell me you know that you'll make it match the rest of my home that would work for me mm. so i think sometimes it's about 
getting away from our professional expertise about what how we would describe it and talking to a client and saying look in your words what does success look like and mm. that may not be fully objective but if they say oh i wanted to be the best possible quality it's like okay well i can't grasp that what do you mean by best possible quality you know are we talking the lamborghini are we talking an audi are we talking a top range ford or are we talking a Traban? you know there's you know give me a comparison give me something that i can actually um, think of so that i understand what you mean so that i can try and reflect it back to you in the contract so yeah. I think that's a real difficulty where the client's expectations are here, but their descriptions are just not matching. And then we end up with them not having clear expectations. Yeah. All about keeping those communication channels going. Yeah, completely. And if if they can't describe it in a way which is objective, say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we have somebody in come in and inspect it and say whether or not they think we've met this requirement because you're not objective enough. You know, the client is never objective enough to say, yes, or you've met my expectations. Yeah. I hope you can't hear my dog scratching at the door in the background. He's, he wants to come in and hear what you've got to say, obviously, Sarah. Um, so we, we've got a question in the box down here. So someone has asked, how do you have the confidence to say no to a client that you know in your gut is uh, your gut is telling you that this is going to be a difficult person to work for? so well the answer is um will it will you make more money leaving them behind and going to find a new client than you would if you stuck with this one because we all know we can we can kind of see them coming and sometimes it's a slight desperation because our order book is empty or our diary is empty and we just think oh i've got to get some work got to get some work but until we say no to the ones that are going to actually drain our energy not make us any money make us unhappy hack off our trades everyone else until we say no to them we have not got the opportunity to get someone new in so yeah. some of it is just about having the courage that round the corner there will be a better client than this one um, and one that will make you happier and you will be able to make happy the ones that are miserable really will you know, think about not every pound is equal. So I often say not every pound is equal, not every hour is equal. Some pounds come with a cost, an energy cost, which is just too high. It makes that pound worth virtually nothing. So think about not just how much money you can make, but actually how much will it cost you that is not maybe money based. Um, yeah. It's difficult to do. It's really difficult to turn work down when you're um, not busy enough. But Generally speaking, there's more work out there at the moment than there has been for a long time. So actually, if you have any doubts, have the courage to walk away and just go, yeah. I'm worth more than this. I guess the trick is to, to determine that at an early enough stage yeah. before you've signed the contract. Yeah, completely. Start and don't work. start. And actually, one of the ways a contract can help you is if you send a contract to a client and they start getting really picky about bits of it, that's another flag that says, oh, oh maybe I should walk away. But if you start work, then send a contract, then they become picky. You're already bound into this project. So that's why the contracts and the, you know, do your work up front don't get so distracted by the project because you want to do the project could be a fabulous project you know it could be great somebody building an observatory or a, you know space day or whatever something that you've really wanted always to do and then you find out that working with them is just a you know hiding to nothing difficult to tell in advance but there's normally good signs early on particularly if you send them a contract and they start going oh i don't think you're um, on the iso register i think yeah. you'll find you're probably not going to comply with your data protection requirements once you hear that sort of thing you go maybe i'll go and do maybe something not. else yes indeed so um rob's asked asked a question he says would you recommend a sales funnel to weed out nightmare clients and i guess he's talking about the sort of having a process to qualify your leads which is is exactly what you've been talking about really isn't it and having those communication those conversations with them. yeah and, um, and and also um once you've been in business for a while you kind of know what your the projects that you get the most satisfaction and you know the clients have got the most satisfaction from so on your website on your shop window you could say oh, these are the projects we work with and if you get something that's not that 
you can kind of say, well, you're not really, but I know someone I can refer you to. So one thing is to have a good network of people that you can refer people to and say, actually, that's not really what we do. Um, that's not our sweet spot, but I know someone for whom that's really, you know, they'd love to do that for you. And the other thing you can do is also have a sort of a checklist of people you won't work with, whether that's ideally a private one <laughs> in somewhere, but also <laughs> just in your head, just saying, I don't want to work for this sort of thing because I've dealt with them before and I know that they're always trouble or they're most often trouble. And sometimes that's that, you know, there, there was that um, uh, uh, psychology thing about maximizers and satisficers. Are they, you know, happy enough with things or are they the maximized, got to get best, 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 best value or best, you know, value for money all the time. The maximizers are really hard clients to actually ever satisfy. You know what? If somebody just wants a porch that's big enough to put some shoes in, that was me, and it met conservation consent, I was happy. <laughs> and they kept coming along going, do you want this sort of finish or this sort of finish? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's difficult because I am a recovering perfectionist. So, you know, <laughs> I've learned, though, that various things don't actually bother me as much as I thought. And sometimes it's about picking up those vibes and just having the courage to turn work away and say, that's not what we do. Or we just, you know, I'm afraid we're too busy to take on your job. You know, you, you don't actually have to say, whoa, I'm out. Um, you can dress it up in a way. And particularly if you've got people to pass them on to, it makes you come across as extremely helpful, trustworthy and everything else without just saying, no, I don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. Um, I love the idea of celebrating at the end of a successful project. I uh, remember an FMB member down in the South that I knew some years ago who always used to take his clients out for dinner at the end of the project and I said that sounds lovely but it also sounds expensive and he said yeah it is we take them to a really nice restaurant but he said I always get paid on time at the end they always yeah. pay so it's uh, you know it seemed like a good idea and a particular um, thing that FMB members can do at the moment to celebrate the end of a successful project is um is enter for the Master Builder Awards, which are open at the moment. And there's the link on the website for them to complete the form and submit an entry for the next set of awards, which is a great way to promote your business to future clients and attract the really good ones that you want. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't see that we've got any more questions coming up. So I think we'll let you go now, Sarah. That was really interesting. And I, I love the idea that, you know, we were when we started talking about this webinar, we were thinking about closing off projects at the end of the project. But as you've quite rightly pointed out to us all, that begins at the beginning of the project, doesn't it? And getting everything right in the first place. So, yeah, it's been really useful. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see you at the next webinar, which I've forgotten the date of that. But ah, there we are. You'll receive a follow up email and it'll get uh, have a link to the recording of this webinar and notice of future webinars as well. So I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. And thanks, Sarah, for that presentation. That was great. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye.